Hey guys, welcome back. It's your favorite Gimp of the Limp, and I am here with the next part of Star Wars Outer Rim by Fantasy Flight Games. And in the previous video, we played some of the game. We went back and forth between my character of IG-88 and the AI's character of Lando Calrissian and just played back and forth and let you guys see how the general flow of the game uh, actually progressed. I want to take this video and instead of carrying on with that, I want to show you just a few specific things uh, to make sure to show you all the aspects of the game because I don't know how long I would have to play into it to make sure you guys saw everything that I want you to see. Uh, one of the things that we didn't show previously, we showed one of the nav cards, but I wanted to show for a planet if you're doing an encounter there. So seeing here where our characters are located at, if I decided to do an encounter here and an encounter at the planet, I would draw one of the cards. So this could be one of the cards that I would draw. And you see at the top, it has the ring of Kathleen and then below that, uh, Tacodena, Tacodona, whatever is it, Tacodena. And just depending on whatever planet that you're on, that's going to determine what you do. Now, from what I could tell by reading the AI cards, I don't think the AI ever actually really interacts with these. And it seems to be players only that are interacting with these cards. The AI seems to only interact with the market deck itself. But as an example, if my character IG decided to do this, I would read Ring of Caffeine, and I could discard one of my gear mods to gain credits equal to twice its cost. If you have no gear mods, you may buy the top card of the uh, market deck. So, I mean, that's really not that good because you could already have bought that anyway. Uh, the bottom one's a little cooler for the other planet. You can test your influence, and if you pass, you gain a crew, which would give you an extra uh, skill, strength in this case, and something to aid you in ground combat. You know, during ground combat, your opponent rolls one fewer die. Do remember with this game, there are two different types of combat technically, but they're treated the same. There's ground combat, which will have that symbol, and space combat, which will have that symbol. So all of these different planets and sectors here are going to have a small little deck of cards that are varied like that associated with all of them, but they'll all be based on that thing. You might be able to gain an item, a crew member, some money, you might get hurt, you might gain an extra job. It's a nice way for them to do it. I kind of like the, the system, so uh, the cards are divided between the different planets, and it gives you an extra option if you don't want to do the contacts that are here on the board itself or if all those contacts have been uh, looted and taken off the board already at that point. Something else that we did not get to see was these patrol tokens. You guys see there's a couple of them there, and then there's a couple more over on this side, and each one of these stacks is related to those patrols. So here's an example of one of the patrols we have a Empire Patrol, one of their little shuttlecraft, combat strength of three, and you get 5,000 for defeating it. Thing is, is once this patrol is taken out, that's when the level two patrol would come out. You see, here's another one. I think that thing's called the Gazanti, if I remember right. Uh, a little bit bigger, you see five for its combat value, and that symbol below is a fame point. So you can actually get a fame point uh, for taking these guys on. A little bit harder though, again, with five uh, combat strength. We'll show you the next one going up. Level six for combat skill. Again, another fame point. And it's only the second and third tokens that you can get fame points. First one gives you money, and the fourth one doesn't give you anything because that dash means that it's invulnerable. It will always do enough damage in the first round to destroy your ship. You have no chance against it. So basically, once the first three tokens have been taken out of play, then you're just going to have a level four patrolling around the board, auto-killing your ships when it gets near them and has negative influence. You would never choose to encounter it yourself because you automatically lose. There's no benefit uh, at that point. And that I'm kind of iffy on. I can see why they would do that. There's an incentive 
to go after these uh, patrol tokens since you can get fame points for it. But there is a, a cost to that in the fact that the game's going to get harder. There's going to be a invulnerable ship. Not to mention that's like that for each one of the different factions. So if every faction got cleared out to its last ship, you would have four ships flying around, uh, patrols flying around the board that auto-kill anyone. So I like it. It's a, it's a risk-reward thing. And especially if, well, if you could find a way to take and get, you know, the rewards for killing off these guys and then get your reputation up to neutral with that faction, that would help you because they wouldn't automatically gun you down if you encountered them. Uh, just an interesting little bit of strategy involved with the uh, the patrols. Oh, no, I could see the benefit as well, though, for having the level fours maybe be a hard fight, but one that you could win and get two uh, fame points, you know, possibly instead of just having something that's, oh, you're automatically going to lose at this point. Let's take and actually show an example of how combat would work, just as a quick example. So let's say our empire token here, patrol, got moved in one, two, 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 and it got up here to the planet where I was located, and I decided to do a combat with it. Again, you can see it's got three as its combat skill. We look at me, I've got three as my combat skill. I've taken the previous damage off my ship. I'm just doing this as, uh, as an example. So remember, the combat's going to be the attacker rolls his dice, the defender rolls his dice, and whoever gets the most hits wins. So let's have a quick combat against that patrol. I'll roll my attack first. I get three dice. We'll roll them. See what I can get. And in this case, I actually got three. That's pretty decent. Crits count as two. Single hit count as one. So I got a score of three. Let's see what the AI, or not the AI, the patrol did. The patrol got nothing. So they would lose this combat. If that were to happen, you would take this. It gets removed from the game. I would get 5,000 credits for beating them. Throw that down over there. But there is a negative. I would go down in reputation. So my empire reputation would go down for destroying the empire patrol. You take the next one on the stack. It goes in the first uh, nav point right there. And then they start patrolling again as usual. And then you progress through each one of the stacks that way. So that's how you would get your, um, uh, your money, some rewards, fame points, things like that if you want to go after these patrols. But to get the, the level twos and threes, you're really going to need to get new ships because it's going to be hard to take those guys out when they're rolling five and six dice versus your two or three dice. You're going to have to get really lucky. Although anyone who's played X-Wing can know the dice god can and will frown or smile in your favor, just depending. Now, previously, we didn't see anyone actually gain any fame points. But let's just say for our example that my guy did his missions and he patrolled all the way around the galaxy and he got to the destination he was going to, which I think is the C1 right here. And that's the place that he's going to turn in his bounty. During his uh, action step, right there, your second one, is when you would take and turn in your bounties. You would remove the card and the bounty from the game and gain whatever rewards were listed down, which we can see. For this, for a capture, is 10,001 fame. So grab your 10,000 token, throw it down, and then this is where the little fame markers come into it. So you would move this up when you start to gain fame. And remember, this is your timer for the game. It's got the little mark right there because generally you're going to uh, play to 10, but you can choose any number you want. You can play up to 12. Or technically, there's no one stopping you from playing past 12 if you really wanted to. You just keep going along the line. Uh, you can do the beginner game, start with 8, or whatever your people have time for, whatever you guys just decide to do amongst yourselves. But you keep track of your fame right there. Now, speaking of winning the game, when it comes to the AI, you know, I was thumbing through the deck, and I was actually talking to some buddies of mine who have... Uh, tried the game out as well 
and the AI has a fairly distinct advantage. And that's going to happen in any game where you have an AI because, I mean, it's pretty obvious the, the AI needs to have a touch of an advantage so they can have the chance to win. A game's not going to be fun if you can just smoke check the AI player every single time and then you always know you're going to win. I'm sure someone could try to min-max, you know, whatever game. It seems, though, that these AI cards give them just a little bit too much of an advantage. Like in this example, there's a reveal the face down contact token of the lowest class on the planet and gain the crew on its card for free. There's a few different little things like that where the AI gets a fame point, gets crew, gets mods, gets whatever it is, and it's not having to put in the negative effects that the human players have to. Now, you can use the AI, again, not just by yourself, but you could use it if you wanted a third or fourth player, you know, in a two or three player game. You know, it's a nice little addition to have. Just something that you need to keep in mind is the AI uh, player is fairly ruthless. They are going to gun down the objectives as quick as possible, and they're going to get a fair amount of advantages to them. They're going to get things for free. They're going to get fame points in ways that you can't get fame points. Uh, I'm I'm out on it. The people I talked to did say that they think that the AI has too much of an advantage. I would rather the AI have a little bit too much than not enough advantage, because if it's not enough, then the game's not worth playing. I would have to play it a lot more to gauge it, but just something to keep in mind if you're playing the game. And you can potentially house rule anything like that that uh, was causing you issues. Just, hey, the AI has to pay 2000 or it doesn't get the car for free. It has to make the same test. You know, whatever uh, the case might be. Okay, so some final thoughts on Star Wars Outer Rim real quick. You know, is this a game for you? Well, that's going to depend on a few things. I will tell you, I finally actually got to go play X-Wing again last night with some buddies in my gaming group, and I talked to them about this specific game, and more than one admitted wholeheartedly that the only reason they were thinking about buying the game itself was to get the yellow special dice that come with it, and I got to give it to FFG. They know exactly what they're doing by putting cool looking, because they've got like a marble design, I'll throw a picture on screen for you guys, but they've got like a marble design for the dice. Uh, they look neat and not everyone's going to have them, so people will buy it for that. But a lot of the guys that I talked to are planning on waiting to see if they can find the game on sale uh, at one of the different websites or Amazon, something like that, because they do want to get it, but they don't want to pay, you know, $50 for a game they're not probably going to invest that much time in. So, for me, I say this game is going to be one for people who like the, the fetch and deliver style. If you like fetch and deliver and you want something like that in a Star Wars universe, this is going to be up your alley. It is rather simplistic, though. The main chunk of the game is based around uh, interacting with the market deck and then minor interactions with uh, the planet interaction, the uh, planet encounter cards. I do like the way that they did the contact encounters with the fact that there is the special deck that has uh, different cars associated with whatever the crew might be or the, the person, and it gives you a special little snippet. I would have liked to have seen more of that and less generic here, like that be more prevalent than this, but this seems to be the, the head. I do like the fact that they do have all the cool ships in the game that you can take an upgrade to like the the shadow caster and actually i don't know that one heavy duty lifter whichever that one's from slave one obviously and you can see obviously the stats are different for all the ships and the ships have their own uh goals that they have to accomplish just like your player characters do so that's a neat addition for the game the game itself it's going to be for a hardcore star wars fan if you're not Sorry, I had a real loud truck driving by. If you're not a hardcore uh, core Star Wars fan, I would skip this. There are other games in uh, the genre that will do you better. But if you are a Star Wars fan, this is, and you like the fetch and deliver, this one will fit your uh, your gameplay needs 
It's neat the fact that it has a different type of player board. It's not just a usual mounted board, just fold it out onto your table. The fact that you do have a rim that is assembled and you can assemble it in different ways. It doesn't always have to be set up in this configuration. You can shuffle the, uh, the pieces around. That gives the game a fair amount of replayability. That's the bigger part of the replayability because after you've played it a handful of times, you're going to have a good idea what's definitely in the market deck, what's in that deck, and it'll take you probably four or five plays to have a fairly uh, good idea what's going to be in these encounter decks. All right, so if you're a family that's into Star Wars and you're going to play this with multiple people, definitely I would go ahead and give it a go. If you're looking for a solitaire game uh, gameplay experience, I don't think this one delivers enough with the AI deck. It just doesn't play well enough solitaire to be worth it. I think there are better games out there that uh, you should go for rather than Outer Rim for a solitaire experience. But if you do have friends that will play the game with you and you want to play it solitaire, I would go for it You know, under those circumstances. But for pure solitaire play, no. This one's a pass on that one. All right, that's going to be it for me, though. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I do have a bunch of other new stuff coming up. You guys, if you hear this part, I am going to be a little lax on videos for the next couple of days as I get prepped up. My brother's actually coming into town again, and we're going to do another big game session where we break out a lot of games that I have a harder time showing off uh, without someone there with me. Uh, stuff like Speed Freaks, as an example. We're going to have that on the table. Uh, and a few other games you guys, uh, guys haven't seen before. So you guys stay tuned for that. I will be getting those up starting next week. All right, that's going to be it for me. You guys take care. I'll catch you in the next one.